1 John chapter 1, and we're going to begin with verse 8 this morning, looking at the subject of what hinders God's cleansing power in your life. Now, in our previous study, we, we looked at the, the central issue that John has brought up here in this first chapter, addressing what ruins our fellowship, what hinders our fellowship with the Lord. And yet we also looked at God's provision for that problem we call sin, that the scripture calls sin. And walking in darkness. What is that solution? Well, he declares here for us in uh, verses 5 through 7 that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, uh, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, there is the solution. The blood of Christ is continually cleansing us from all sin. But the natural question that would, would come up in your mind is, well, if God's blood is sufficient, if it's cleansing us continually, why isn't every believer then in fellowship with God? Why aren't they all cleansed? Why aren't they all enjoying this sweet fellowship and the joy that results from that fellowship? Well, John gives us three very specific, very direct reasons here in our text this morning. And so beginning verse 8, read with me. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now, the question here is, what hinders God's cleansing process from occurring in an individual's life? If you look at verse 9, this is clearly still in John's mind when he says, if God forgives us, he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So he's continuing on the thought from verse 7 that this issue of this continual cleansing needs to occur. But what hinders it? Well, the first thing that he addresses here is in verse 8. It's the issue of self-deception. Now note here that John declares that if we say, if this is what our profession is, that we have no sin, then we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So clearly, deceiving yourself is a major problem. Now notice here this, this term, if we say that we have no sin. Now the sin that he is describing here is not the, the issue of the, the practice of sin. We're talking about the nature of sin. That if I say I am not a sinner by nature, then I am deceiving myself. In verse 10, he addresses the practice, the behavior that comes forth from that nature. As he said, if we say we have not sinned, the action of sin, the practical things that we do that are clearly sin. And so he first addresses this idea, this concept, this statement or profession that someone would make. I'm not a sinner. Now, some people say, well, Steve, would anybody ever say they are not a sinner? I mean, would anybody ever think that or declare that to you? And I would say absolutely they have. I've had people look me straight in the face and tell me, I am not a sinner. <laughs> and I've had it more times than I can count. Many times. Not just a few. And I think that the more our society moves away from our Judeo-Christian ethics and from the, the whole concept of being a nation built upon biblical principles, and we become a secular society, we will hear it more and more. The subject of my sin 
is the issue here. And what I think about myself and what I profess to others about my sin. If I declare that I am not a sinner, then I am deceiving myself. Now, self-deception is really one of the great snares of the human heart. And we are warned over and over again in Scripture to beware of this issue. Christians are warned not to deceive themselves. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3.18, very directly, he told the Christian believers, let no one deceive himself. That's pretty straightforward. Galatians 6.3, he said, if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. And so clearly we are warned in these passages and in our text this morning, don't deceive yourself because that is the real potential for every single one of us. Now you say, well, Steve, I think I'm a sinner. I, I don't think that that's a question this morning. Well, there are others that do not believe this. And when you come upon this issue, when you meet with individuals that declare that they are not sinners, and they are professing to know the Lord, which I had a circumstance, gosh, this is probably 20 years ago now. I had a group of individuals came in to my office one day and they were going to bring to me the truth. And they were going to share with me the truth that they had come to. That they had arrived at this place of sinless perfection. And that I really didn't understand the scripture, I didn't understand the truth, or I would have come to this place as well. And I just said to them, this is a total contradiction of 1 John 1 8. If we say, if you say, if I say that I have no sin, well, we're in total denial. We are in denial of the reality, the obvious reality of where our, our hearts really are. You see, I think that this issue of self-deception is a part of our very nature. We are good at it. Every one of us. We are, we are very good at it. That's why we are warned about it so many times in Scripture. It says in Hebrews 3.13 that we are to be careful not to be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Because sin itself is deceitful. And it brings us to this place of deceitfulness with others and then deceiving ourselves that we're okay. That there's really no problem. Now other people don't, they aren't as blatant about the, the fact that they are not sinners, but they will declare to you something that sounds like this. They will say, well, Steve, I, I'm really a good person. And I, I, I think that the good things that I do outweighs the mistakes that I have made in life. And they usually word, use the word mistake or error. They don't use the word sin. Because if a person uses the word sin, then they, they validate the truth of God's word that there is such a thing as sin. So we change the wording a little bit. And as the person changes the words, they are literally justifying themselves and declaring, I'm really not a sinner. I'm not such a bad sinner. I'm just, I'm, I'm a pretty good sinner. <laughs> and I do more good things than I do bad things. And yet, by, by making this statement, a person is declaring that they are going to be saved by their good deeds. This is what gives me access and entry into God's presence or His kingdom. And there are many cults today that base their relationship on how many good deeds they have done. And this is not sufficient because Scripture tells us, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, that 
I am saved by grace through faith, and that is not even of myself, not even the faith. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There is no work or no amount of works that could ever give me a place of salvation or forgiveness. Then still there are others who compare themselves with, with individuals around them that they deem inferior to them. Very much like the Pharisee and the publican, the story that Jesus told in Luke 18, verses 11 and 12. It says, The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And he went on and on and on about all of his, what he had done. And so note here that this is really kind of a combination of the two. There's a comparison. You know, you can compare yourself with somebody else and, and think, well, I'm doing better than they are, so I'm not that bad. And then you can plead your good deeds to try and outweigh what you have done that is evil. But there is no basis before God to bring this about. In Proverbs 20, verse 9, there Solomon says, Who can say, I have made my heart clean? I am pure from my sin. There is no one that can say that. Absolutely no one on this planet except for one individual who lived here for a very short time because he asked, which one of you has ever seen me sin? Now, have you ever, would you ever think to make that statement to your husband or wife or to your family members? I mean, we, we chuckle because we know all we'd have to do is ask the question and they could point out several places where we had sinned very easily. And so I cannot declare that. I can't, I can't claim that in any way, shape, or form. Now, the Bible does promise freedom from sin's domination, but it does not ever promise freedom from the presence of sin. And that is a distinction that is very important to note. God promises that I can be free from sin's power and dominion in my life. Romans 6.14 For sin shall not have dominion over you. Because you are under the grace of God and trusting in the grace and the power of God. But it does not in any way teach that I should be free from the presence of sin. Notice right here in our text, in our next study, in chapter 2, verse 1, John acknowledges this fact. He said, My little children, these things I write to you, that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we, including himself, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. But just by the statement, if anyone sins, is an acknowledgement of the fact that we are going to sin, and that's why we need our advocate, Jesus, the righteous one. And so I am never going to come to this place of sinless perfection. And again, there are, there are Christians that will teach that you can come to this place for a period of time, but that is not what Scripture teaches. I am a sinner by nature. And the moment I think I have come to some place of sinless perfection, I have just sinned by deceiving myself. Because I am corrupt to the core of my nature. That is the way I am. And I can be involved in the most loving, giving, most charitable deeds. And a thought will pass my mind that is as evil and selfish and corrupt as could be. And then you realize, except by the grace of God, I would yield to those thoughts. I would yield to those desires. Except the grace of God keeps me free from sin's dominion, I would follow them. 
And so when people say, except for the grace of God, you say, that's right. That is the issue. That's what keeps us. Now, when I share with people this idea that, and concept that they're never going to be free from sin, people say, well, hey, if there's all this grace and forgiveness and God's continually cleansing, why not just sin and ask the Lord to forgive you and let Him cleanse you? Just kind of do what you want. Well, there is a good reason why you should not think in that direction. In fact, that in itself is self-deception because it will lead you to a path of slavery. Now, right after in Romans 6, verse 14, where he declares, sin shall not have dominion over you, he asks the question, well, if there's all this grace, he said, why should we not just then sin? Why should we not continue to sin if there's all this grace? And so from Romans 6, verse 15, through the end of that chapter, in verse 23, he gives several reasons why you should not give in to sin and just use God's grace and ask His forgiveness down the road. Do what you please and just ask forgiveness. Well, he tells you there these things, and I'll just paraphrase them because we don't have the time to study them, but read these passages maybe later today. Look at them closely. He says this, he says, don't you know that if you yield to sin, he said, whatever you yield to, he said, that individual, you be, it, he becomes your master. You become the slave, and it becomes the master. If you yield to sin, sin will become your master, and you will become its slave. If you yield to God, you will be a slave to righteousness. But the neat thing is, is in that text, it says that if you become his slave, he sets you free. You see, he that has died is set free from the power of sin. And all of a sudden he, and then he goes on to declare how that God will bring forth the fruit of holiness in your life, as opposed to the fruit of death. Because when a person yields to sin, and they play that game of, well, I'll just ask God to forgive me, and I'll do what I please. In reality, they are literally deceiving themselves and then becoming a slave of that very sin that they say, well, people usually say it this way to me. They say, Steve, I didn't mean for it to go this far. How did I get here? How did this happen? I just thought I could play a little bit with this sin. And then this happens. Well, it's, it's really proving Romans 6, 15 through 23 is correct. Yes, God's grace is sufficient to set you free from sin's dominion, but if you play with it, you're going to get caught. You're going to get caught and you're going to become its slave because sin is progressive. It never says enough. Well, I'll let you just play here. No, it says, take some more. It's, you can't just eat one of those potato chips. You can't eat just one of those candies. You will say, I want more. And you will get caught one way or the other. And so be careful not to play this game of self-deception. The second reason that God's cleansing process is hindered is because we are contradicting God and we are seeking to find a contradiction in God. Now this is a very important principle because it's revealed here in verse 10 where he says, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. We make God a liar. Now for a person to declare that they don't sin, they are first contradicting God. They are contradicting God's word. And that's the key. Notice he says, and his word is not in us. Because his word declares I am a sinner. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned. It's pretty clear. All means everybody in this room. 
All means everybody on this planet. Every single person, all have sinned. And that sin has been in thought, in motive, in action, whatever you want, however you want to define it. But there's sin that is there. And so there is a contradiction of God's word. And, and literally, it, is a, it ultimately ends, though, with charging God and trying to find a contradiction in God and in his ways. Now, this is a, an important principle because this, again, is ingrained in the nature of man. Every one of us would like to find an excuse or somebody else to blame for why I do what I do. Blame shifting is self-deception. It is a great way to get out of the, the issue at hand, that I just failed, I just sinned. Probably one of the best examples of this is found in, in Genesis 3, verses 11 and 12. After Adam and Eve sinned and they failed, what did they do? God came to Adam and said, what have you done? And he said, it's the woman that you gave me. And then she turned around and said, well, the devil, he made me do it. He deceived me. And so they both failed to take personal responsibility. They failed to acknowledge honestly their own fault, and they blamed somebody else. Now, Adam is, is the classic one because he blamed his wife and God in one sentence to get out of what he had done. But notice there the charging of God. You see, he's saying, you're the one that gave her to me. You're the one that did this. It's your fault. If you hadn't have given this woman to me, I wouldn't be in this big predicament. And so, not only does he not take responsibility for his own sin and acknowledge it honestly, but he charges God at the same time. And so, when I say, what hinders this process? It's this, we are contradicting God's word in our heart, and we are trying to find a contradiction or in him. We're trying to make him out to be the bad guy. Now, I know every one of you have done this. Every one of us in this room has done it. And we think, you know, when we just really blow it and we just fall on our face, it's like where somebody is at, you know, pointing out some failure in your life, some place where you have offended them. The first thing we're thinking about is, well, if they hadn't have done this, if they hadn't have done that, I wouldn't have done this. And we have this... This, we go through this game inside our head to try and get out of what has just taken place and to point the finger. That is self-deception. It's a different kind of self-deception, but it is still self-deception. And it is to get me to the place where I can get out of this problem. Now, the sinful heart of man wants to find this contradiction in God, and you usually hear it this way. People say, well... I don't think God is fair. I don't think that God really cares. If he cared about me, he wouldn't do this or have allowed that to happen. And so what, what is that statement declaring? It's saying there's a contradiction in you. You're the problem. You're the liar. You didn't tell me the truth. And that's why this is all happening or you didn't do something you were supposed to do, whatever. And this is an issue that you have to look at in your own heart because it'll keep you from the honesty that God requires for you to walk in the light so that you can have fellowship with Him and then experience the goal of fullness of joy. That's the context that we're looking at here. And this is an issue that must be addressed. Now, God takes it personal when you try and charge him because he loves you and he, he doesn't want you to charge him. 
In Job chapter 40, verse 8, notice what the Lord says to Job and to his three friends who have tried to counsel him. And they have sat, and if you read the book of Job, you, you read for 40 chapters the, the confusion, the, the nutty counsel that they were trying to give Job, and even some of Job's crazy statements. He, they just, none of them understood what was happening in this, in this difficulty that was going on in his life. And this is what the Lord says. He said, would you indeed annul my judgment? He said, would you condemn me that you may be justified? You see, that is exactly what the heart of man does. It wants to condemn God so that we can be justified. We are such good rationalizers, excusers, blame shifters, and those that justify ourselves. That's just the way we are. It's just our nature. And it is something that cannot take place if you want to walk in the light, if you want to have fellowship with God and fellowship with your brothers and sisters. It can't happen. This is probably one of the most fundamental thing that destroys marriages, is the unwillingness of people to honestly acknowledge their fault and resolve those issues that are between those people, or any relationship for that matter. So are you charging God? Are you looking for a, an excuse, a way out over anything that is happening in your life? Be careful, because this will not get you to the end you're looking for. Now, the solution to this is very simple. Now, notice the problem is the, his word is not in us. The end of verse 10. Jesus said, here's the solution. In John 8, 31, Jesus said this, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. In John 15, 7, he said, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Now notice there. There's the answer. Now the word abide literally means to remain and ultimately to obey. If you look in the, the context of these passages. If you remain in my word, if you remain in it, yield to it, surrender to it, obey it. He said, that's what it means to be my disciple. He said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, do my words abide in your heart? Because if they do, what happens is that God deals with every single thing that is amiss in my life. That's why your devotional time is so essential. Your pumping in the Word of God into your life, which keeps you honest with yourself, which reveals what is, is wrong with your attitude, your goals, your motives, your desires, everything. He is addressing those issues every single day, which keeps you honest before Him, which will allow you to be cleansed and come into that fellowship. Now, third and last, the last reason why this cleansing process is hindered is the lack of confession. In verse 9 here, he says, if we confess our sins. Now, what God requires from us is very simple. It's not difficult. It's not more difficult or deep or profound that we can't really grasp it. It's something that's very simple. He just wants me to honestly confess my sins to him. And he'll forgive me. And he'll keep on forgiving me. He will bring that constant forgiveness, that continual cleansing, that keeps me in that fellowship with God, enjoying the joy, the fullness of joy that he wants to give me. Now, the word to confess here literally means to agree with. You have to agree with him. Yes, this was wrong. 
And so often, you know, that's all someone that comes to you declaring to you that you have offended them. That's all they're asking for you to do. Just agree with me. Yes, that was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have had that attitude. I shouldn't have said those words. I shouldn't have, have taken that action. That's all somebody re is requiring. And they can then let it go and forgive you. The same thing is true with the Lord. In Jeremiah 3, 13, God speaking through this prophet says to the people, only acknowledge your iniquity that you have transgressed against the Lord your God. That's what he says. Only acknowledge your iniquity. Just acknowledge it. Just say yes. Yes, I have failed. I have sinned. And he will forgive them. But in that acknowledgement, in that confession of sin, there must be a forsaking of sin and a sincere desire to forsake what you have done. In Proverbs 28, verse 13, it declares there, He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. In James 5, 16, he says, Confess your trespasses one to another. He says, Praying one for another that you might be healed. He said, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. We need to confess, and we need to do it honestly, with the intention that we are going to pray and ask for power to forsake it. Now, honest confession, sincere confession, will always seek to forsake what they are confessing. It is it's a natural thing. If that person is not seeking to forsake their, their sin, then they are deceiving themselves again. It's a game. It's that game we started out with that I explained to you. I'm just going to ask forgiveness and do what I please. And that is self-deception. God knows my heart, and He knows whether I mean business or not. He knows whether I'm just going through the motions. And to those that play that game, I guarantee you they are not going to experience the fellowship and the joy that God intends for them because it's dishonesty and it is uh, the self-deception in full bloom. Now this word confess here is in the present tense. It describes here something that I must continually do. Now, why do I need to continually confess my sins? Simply because I'm continually falling short and missing the mark. Again, Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The word come short is in the present tense. Those words describe my, well, the reality of my life, the reality of your life. We are all continually coming short. So I need to continually confess my sin. It's that simple. Now there is also a segment of the church that I believe is in great error when they tell you you only have to confess your sins when you first invite Jesus to come in and take over your life. You never need to confess your sins after that. Well here, in 1 John 1, 9, is a verse of scripture that I believe is so clear, so plain, so direct, that refutes that concept. That, that truth or that error should never be taught in the church. The church should never accept that truth. Because it really is ruining the intimacy and the fellowship and the fullness of joy that God wants to give. Because when you sin, it brings forth death. Now, we all know what that feels like. Death. It's just when you fail, you offend someone, you do something you know you shouldn't do, do you feel all elated and joyful and, oh, I'm, I'm just doing great. No, you feel terrible. It's the fruit of sin, which is death. The wages of sin is death. 
It always has been. It always will be. It'll never change. But he wants to give me life. But I, to get that life, that joy, I have to confess my sin. I have to acknowledge it. I will always have to acknowledge it. And as I do, that joy, that life comes again. Another passage that makes it clear that those that are believers, those that are forgiven, baptized in the body of Christ, that they have to ask for forgiveness. Here's another passage. Put this verse next to this 1 John 1, 9. It's Acts 8, 22. There is the story, if you read the entire chapter, you'll see there that Philip came down to Samaria. He preached the word. Many people, multitudes got saved, including one man named Simon, who was into magical arts. And he, it says, believed and he was baptized. Now, that sounds like a true believer to me. But as a young believer, really very ignorant of God's ways and God's, God's truth, he came to Peter one day and said, I want to buy the gift of laying on of hands. How much will it cost me? And Peter said this to him. He told him, Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. Isn't that interesting? He tells a believer who was baptized, who was a obvious Christian, that he needed to pray to God, not confess to some man, but pray to God and ask for forgiveness. And so... These two passages should make it very clear, you need to do it. You need to do it daily. Now, the benefits of this confession are you are free from condemnation. You are exempt from the penalties of your sin. You are cleansed and you are restored to fellowship with God. That is the benefit. One of the most powerful truths in Scripture is Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation, not a little bit, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. If you're walking after Him, you're following Him, you're walking in the light, you should be free from condemnation, free from that death that comes from sin. You should be filled with life. He that hath the Son hath life. Now, these are the benefits. Now, notice this word forgiveness and the word cleanse here in verse 9. He is faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse. Now, these two words really need to be understood because they are powerful. The word forgive literally means to cancel the debt that is against you. When God forgives you, he cancels your debt. In uh, Acts, it talks about him blotting out our transgressions or literally just erasing them off the ledger. He says, you don't owe me anything. You're free. This word forgive is also translated several places in the New Testament, divorce, which many Christians don't know. Think about this. This word divorce gives you the understanding of what he has actually done. God has divorced you or separated you completely from your debt to him. He has severed you as people are severed in marriage. So think about that. When you are beating yourself up for some past sin that you just, you won't receive God's forgiveness for. Do it this morning. He has canceled your debt. He has divorced you from your debt. And this, this term, debt, is a, well, Jesus uses this image over and over again in Scripture when he spoke about forgiveness. He used it in reference to financial debt to describe because everybody knows what financial debt is, and they know 
what a joy it is to be forgiven your financial debt. And so in Matthew 18, 21 through 27, where Peter comes to, to Jesus, he says, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but to seventy times seven. Therefore, now Jesus teaches a parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. Now that's a whole lot of money. Ten thousand talents. A talent was seventy-five pounds. Ten thousand of them. But he was not able to pay, and his master commanded him to be sold, and his wife and his children, and all that he had, and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. Now that's you. That's me. He has taken my 10,000 talents of sin, and he has forgiven me simply because he has had compassion on me. And that's what he's done with you. Receive it today. The word cleanses here literally means to purify or to make clean. He not only sets me free from my debt, but he cleans me up afterward. He purifies my heart before him. And he gives me pure motives now. He gives me pure desires, pure goals. Yes, there's still that conflict that's going on inside me with other goals, other desires. But that's why the conflict is there, because he has purified my heart. And he has given me these other purified motives. It says in Isaiah 1, 18, Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. You see, the Lord cleanses you, and he cleanses that stain from your life. And forever it's gone. And that is the joy that you should be experiencing in your heart this morning. Now, what is the guarantee of this full forgiveness that he offers in this passage? Notice it's his character. It's God's character that guarantees this. He says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to do this. He's the faithful one. He is the just one. He will do what he promises. It says here this word faithful. Faithful literally means sure or trustworthy. He is the trustworthy one. He will do what he says. He is the righteous one. And it's righteous for him to do this because he has justified you. He has forgiven you by the shed blood of Christ. And so it's a just and righteous thing that he forgives because you are fulfilling his request to acknowledge your sin and ask forgiveness. And so he can righteously grant forgiveness. And he is trustworthy to do it. It says in Isaiah 46, 11, God says, Indeed, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. When God promises, he fulfills his promise. And so trust him this morning. If there is self-deception, you see something in your heart this morning, ask his forgiveness. If you're charging God or contradicting his word, ask his forgiveness. If you haven't, simply just come to confess. Do so this morning. Let's pray together.